Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. What is Albert Camus' orientation towards and relationship with the other figures that we typically call existentialist, and which he himself in the myth of Syphysis is going to identify as existentialists or as existentials. He distances himself quite explicitly from most of them, saying that the existentials are doing something different than what a philosophy of the, of the absurd, which is what he is endorsing and articulating, would require. There, there's not a complete disjunction, though, in that both of them are, in fact, engaging the absurd, both of them meaning Camus on one side and perhaps Nietzsche and Heidegger with him and all the other people that he lines up as the existentialists who are you know, typically engaging in some sort of escape on the other side. So Camus is going to criticize the existentialists, but if we want to talk about him in, in a very broad sense as being part of the existentialist movement, that is perfectly fine and makes sense and is, is, is warranted, provided we understand that he means something a little bit more restrictive when he's distancing himself from the existentialists. Now, what is going on? Why is he criticizing them? In, in some respects, it's because he's quite close to them. He sees a not just a common thread, but a whole network of common threads uniting them. And one of the key aspects of that is that the existentialists, in the sense that Camus is talking about, do in fact found or ground their thought upon an encounter with the absurd, whether they do this in terms of writing philosophy or in more literary ways of writing plays, short stories, novels, poetry, they are engaging with a universe that doesn't line up with human beings in which human beings can feel themselves, you might say, at a loss or foreigners within their own cosmos. And so he's going to talk about an, what he calls an entire family of minds um, related by their nostalgia but opposed by their method or aims that have persisted in blocking the royal road of reason and in recovering the direct paths of truths. And he, he says, here I assume these thoughts to be known and to be lived, whatever may be or have been their ambitions, all started out from that indescribable universe where contradiction, antinomy, anguish, or impotence reigns. So the, the existentialists have a common starting point. As a matter of fact, it's not just the existentialists. It would be others as well. Um, he talks about phenomenologists like Husserl and Shaler. Uh, he also talks about a number of other people at different points. But he's, he's focusing on the existentialists. And let's think about some of these things. So they are related by their nostalgia. Nostalgia for what? Nostalgia for what they never had. Human beings have a nostalgia for a kind of unity or coherence to experience an existence that has never been the case. We have this, you might say, tragic or absurd, if, if we're using the term very loosely and not exactly in Camus' sense, drive to find meaning in things. And not just lowercase meaning, but, but grand, you know, uppercase meaning, but it doesn't exist. And every time that we tell ourselves that we've attained it or that it's there on the horizon, Camus says we're actually, unfortunately, deluding ourselves. <laughs>
So the existentialists are in this, this family. They, they have different methods or aims, right? But they, like he says, they have persisted in blocking the royal road of reason. They are not rationalists. They are, while they're using the tool of reason, they're also being critical of it and its pretensions. And he says, recovering the direct paths of truth. Existentialism, just as much as the philosophy of the absurd, focuses on concrete existence, on real life situations, and on you know relations between human beings to elucidate the, the truths or the experiences or the essences even out of them. Now, Camus is going to say a little bit later in the text that the existential attitude is a form of philosophical suicide. What does that mean? Why is he claiming that? Well, it all has to do with the relationship to the absurd. Camus thinks that many of the existentialists, while they are beginning from the absurd like him as a starting point, they're not remaining with the absurd in the way that Camus is advocating in his philosophy of the absurd. He's saying that we have to take on the absurd, realize that it's there, realize that it it pervades all of our existence, that we can never get rid of it, and that we also cannot come to terms with it. What he's accusing the existentialists of doing is, you might say, defanging the absurd, domesticating it, turning it into something that works for them in one way or another, and thereby either making some sort of escape or eliciting hope or engaging in some sort of leap that takes them either directly into the absurd in a way different than the philosophy of the the absurd or in effect beyond the absurd and into something else. In the case of some of the existentialists, like, for example, Lev Shestov or Søren Kierkegaard, into God. Likewise, he says for Dostoevsky and Kafka in their stories, in both the plot and the characters expressing the author's point of view, which we'll get to in a moment. So this is a a criticism. He's saying that they're in effect committing not physical suicide, but philosophical suicide in that they're using their mind, they're using the absurd to get so far, and then they're doing something different that amounts to shutting their minds off, uh, no longer, you know, connecting their, their experience after the leap with what went before the leap. In his work, Camus is going to discuss the existentialists at many different points. And I think that we can associate them into three different groups. Maybe we could say four as well, because there's also the group of existentialists who he doesn't mention, but definitely knows about. He, and in that group would be Jean-Paul Sartre, who he briefly alludes to as a author who, who, you know, identifies nausea. Sartre's nausea was written several years before the myth of Sisyphus came out. So it's very clear that, that Camus has that in mind, but he doesn't reference Sartre anymore after that. So what would these groups be? The first group would include Jaspers, Shestov. Notice that, that, you know, uh, in this work, the myth of Sisyphus, um, Shestov is written with a CH. That's because of the French spelling, but it's really SH. Either one is fine. Um, Kierkegaard, they, they all fit into one common group that, that Camus is going to criticize. Another group would be the more literary figures. And you might be surprised to see Kierkegaard in there, but Kierkegaard is, in fact, writing works that are sort of on the cusp of philosophy and literature. So we have Kafka, Dostoevsky, and Kierkegaard in that group. And then finally, we have Heidegger and Nietzsche being brought up as well. And Heidegger and Nietzsche make an interesting pairing because Camus is, is not really criticizing them as such. As a matter of fact, he seems to view what they're doing 
as much closer to his philosophy of the absurd than the other people within the existentialist movement or spectrum. So let's take a look at what he says about Heidegger first. He says, Heidegger considers the human condition coldly and announces that existence is humiliated. The only reality is anxiety in the whole chain of beings to the man lost in the world and its diversions. This anxiety is a brief fleeting fear. But if that fear becomes conscious of itself, it becomes anguish, the perpetual climate of the lucid man in which existence is concentrated. And he goes on talking about this. Uh, he, he says that uh, to conclude at the end of Heidegger's analysis that the world can no longer offer anything to the man filled with anguish. This anxiety seems to him so much more important than all the categories in the world that he thinks and talks only of it. He enumerates its aspects, boredom when the ordinary man strives to quash it, terror when the mind contemplates death. He too does not separate consciousness from the absurd. Um, the consciousness of death is the call of anxiety and existence then delivers itself its own summons through the intermediary of conscience. It is the very voice of anguish. It adjures its existence to return from its loss in the anonymous they. So Camus is going to conclude here that Heidegger stands in this absurd world and points out its ephemeral character. He seeks his way amid these ruins. That seems to be an endorsement of Heidegger and his philosophy and his position at that point. Now, Camus also mentions Nietzsche at a number of different points throughout the work. Uh, I'm just going to bring up two that show you that he seems to view Nietzsche in a rather positive light in, in terms of this criticism. So he brings him up in, in the section Absurd Creation with Philosophy and Fiction. And he says that um, in this regard, with, with the regard of you know living with the absurd, learning its lessons, recovering their flesh, in this regard, the absurd joy par excellence is creation. And here he brings up a quote from Nietzsche, art and nothing but art, we have art in order to not die of the truth. So art provides us, or creativity provides us with one way of addressing the absurd. A bit later, he is going to bring up uh, Nietzsche again, um, and he's going to tell us that, um, here we go, in his section on Kafka, he says, um, the more exciting life is, the more absurd is the idea of losing it. This is perhaps the secret of that proud aridity felt in Nietzsche's work, aridity, dryness, sort of the desert, right? In this connection, he says, Nietzsche appears to be the only artist to have derived the extreme consequences of an aesthetic of the absurd inasmuch as his final message lies in a sterile and conquering lucidity and an obstinate negation of any supernatural consolation. So it appears that, well, you know, Nietzsche and Heidegger are not doing exactly the same thing that Camus is, and their viewpoint on the universe is not exactly the same as that of Camus, that he views them as much more closely aligned to what he's advocating in this work, the myth of Sisyphus. Let's turn now to um, the, char the characters uh, in and the plots in Kafka, Dostoevsky, and Kierkegaard. He tells us in a section on Dostoevsky that Dostoevsky has characters who are indeed absurd characters. And, and you could imagine that if Dostoevsky had died before writing the brothers Karamazov, that Camus would have a very different interpretation of him. He talks about Kirillov in The uh, Possessed, a, a play, by the way, that, that uh, uh, Camus put on. Well, it's a novel. He adapted it into a play. Uh, Kirillov is a very interesting character. We can think of others as well. And these are absurd characters, he says. But what ends up happening? says that, that uh, the novels, like the diary, propound the absurd question. They establish logic onto death, exaltation, dreadful freedom. The glory of the czars become human. All is well. Everything is permitted. Nothing is hateful. These are absurd judgments. But what ends up happening is that in the brothers Karamazov, Kirillov, Stavrogin, and Ivan are defeated. Why? Because Dostoevsky 
takes the same sort of leap in his characters as the other existentials or existentialists are proposing in their philosophical works. Right? So he says, the brothers Karamazov replies to the possessed. It is indeed a conclusion. Alyosha's case, the Alyosha is the young monk, the brother of the, Kar- the other Karamazovs, is not ambiguous. Right? Uh, Alyosha clearly says, we shall meet again. There is no longer any question of suicide and madness. What is the use for anyone who's sure of immortality and its joys? Man exchanges his divinity for happiness. So, Camus' point here is he says, it's not an absurd novelist addressing us, but an existential novelist. Um, what about Kafka? Again, we could say if, if Kafka, now Kafka died leaving his novels unfinished and it, with instructions actually to destroy them, which his literary executor Max Brod did not follow. But if, if Kafka had only written the trial and his short stories, Camus would have a different viewpoint on him. But he writes another novel called The Castle. And Camus is going to tell us that uh, just like these other existentialist figures, uh, you know, Kafka is posing the absurd. He's, he's showing it to us in the trial, but then he's in effect taking it back in the castle. He says, um, uh, it would be intelligent to consider as inevitable the progression leading from the trial to the castle. Joseph K., the character of the trial, who's killed in the end like a dog, and the land surveyor K., who's constantly trying to get into this castle, are merely two poles that attract Kafka. And Camus' point is, again, that the, the work of Kafka is going to be existentialist insofar as the absurd is being leapt beyond uh, in the castle. Kierkegaard himself poses a really interesting issue, um, in part because Kierkegaard has all of these different pseudonyms and characters and is doing something rather similar to what um, Kafka and Dostoevsky are doing, uh, proposing different ways of being through them. Many of them are, in fact, uh, in some respect, rooted in the absurd. However, the problem is that Kierkegaard himself, as the author, as the person articulating it, is carrying out this very explicit leap of faith beyond and into the absurd. Um, you know, so for example, in Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard will have Abraham and, and any other knight of, of faith um, essentially believing, living, acting by virtue of the absurd, which seems to be a domestication of the absurd in this case. When we turn then to the this other group, Jasper, Shestov, and Kierkegaard, who he discusses as a group very early on, um, and also in as, as representatives of the existentials a little bit later on, he views all three of them as exploring the absurd, realizing that that you know what it is that we take as having definite meaning and grounding is actually pretty groundless. But then going beyond that by virtue of that very absurd. So let's, let's take a look at Jaspers for just a moment. Um, he says that uh, Jaspers despairs of any ontology because he claims we've lost our naivete. He knows we can achieve nothing that will transcend the fatal game of appearances. He knows the end of the mind is failure. But in that failure, he's going to use that to carry out this leap and to thereby restore hope. He says that he's left powerless to realize the transcendent, incapable of plumbing the depth of experience, and conscious of that universe upset by failure. Will he advance or at least draw the conclusions from that failure? No. Uh, Without justification, as he says to himself, he suddenly asserts all at once the transcendent, the essence of experience, and the superhuman significance of life when he writes... Does not the failure reveal beyond any possible explanation and interpretation, not the absence, but the existence of transcendence? And Camus says, nothing logically prepares this reasoning. I can call it a leap. And this is what he takes to be there in these, these existentialist philosophers like Jaspers, like Shestov, even more with Shestov, and even more so 
perhaps with Kierkegaard. An interesting reflection given that by this time Shestoff had written his book on Kierkegaard's existential philosophy where he said that Kierkegaard didn't go quite far enough. But this gives you a good understanding of what it is that Camus is criticizing in what he's calling existentialist figures and why he would want to distinguish himself from them, claiming that his philosophy of the absurd, beginning from the same starting points, continues on a different path of reasoning that the existentialists are ultimately abandoning.